Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Conspiracy theories. You should reject these voices. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. But I want to say one thing to the American people. It's a big club. And you ain't in it. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't care about you at all. Outrageous conspiracy theories. You should reject these voices. I want to say this to the television. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Beard World Order. I am your co-host, Guillermo Jimenez of TracesOfReality.com, joined as always by James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. And on today's show, we've got a special guest with us, Mr. Pierce Redman of Pierce Policy Radio. PiercePolicyReview.wordpress.com is the website. Pierce, did I get the website right? And how you doing, man? <laughs> it's a, I'm doing good. It's actually Porkins. Policy Porkins Review. Policy Review. I meant yeah. I, that's what I meant to say. Didn't I say that? Uh, no, we're, you we're, said Pierce Policy Review. We're doing that again. I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> no, no we're actually not. Here, I'm first guest on the show. And, <laughs> and we're off to a flying start. Yeah, this is a great start so far. <laughs> Porkins Policy Radio. Pierce Redman is the man who's with us today. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. James, how you doing the this morning? Is, is, <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. Pork, the website is Porkins Policy Review. Porkins Policy Review. Dot WordPress dot com. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I know it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, but. it's rather it's longish, work. but yeah. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of stuck with it now. I don't think I can switch it. No, <laughs> gone too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. James, yourself, how you doing? I'm doing all right, but actually, I'm kind of jealous of Guillermo Jimenez, so maybe you can just call me Yamez Corbet or something. You know, a little bit of flair to it. With the soft J. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. That sounds good. We'll do that, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if that sticks, perhaps. <laughs> well, anyway, so on today's show, what we'll be discussing is, I guess I'll just throw it out there. We're discussing the, the, the potential for a possible... World War Three type scenario, right? And I think I'll let James sort of set this up for the audience, but I'll open this up with a quick tweet that I came across the other day by Charlie Skelton, actually. Uh, you guys out there might know him from his coverage of the Bilderberg Group. Uh, he's called, they call him the Guardian Charlie or something like that, right? So uh, he, this is, I found it rather humorous. So it's, it's, it says, I find it particularly touching that we're commemorating the start of World War I by starting World War Three. And that, that, I think, sums up what we're going to be talking about here today, in a way. So, uh, James, if you, don't, if you wouldn't mind kind of introducing the topic here for our audience. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're exactly plucking this out of left field. I don't think this is going to come as a big shock to anyone, as uh, Charlie's making fun of there. I mean, I think we've all heard by now this sort of, you know, isn't it ironic, 100 years after World War I, it looks like we're heading to World War Three. And again, this is part of the, uh, the zeitgeist. Uh, not the video series, of course, the good German meaning of that, the time spirit that we're living in. Uh, U.S. Uh, wants World War III because its big banks are insolvent, claims Press TV. And uh, NBC News counters with uh, former Ukrainian interim PM Yatsenyuk, who said Russia wants to start World War III. Uh, Mail Online has a uh, article, Edward Lucas, I hope I'm wrong, but historians may look back and say this was the start of World War III. Um... We have LaRouche Pack that has an entire page up on Stop World War III. Um, we have a post from Global Research, Professor Chosadovsky, Ukraine, the worst case scenario is World War III. Again, this has been kicked around quite a bit of late, so I don't think, again, we're going out on a limb with it. But I guess what I'd like to drill down on today is a couple of topics. I mean, first of all, how likely is World War III, really? I mean, do do you see this actually um, eventuating, or is this part of a different agenda? Is there something else that we're looking at? Are we looking at more of a some sort of Cold War scenario? Uh, is this likely to turn hot? And then I guess the other question would be: Well, then if it is heading to World War III, what would be what what is the flashpoint? Um, what are the battle lines? Um, what would it look like? So a lot to, to delve into, a lot of meat to, uh, to sink our teeth into. And I guess uh, since this is, Pierce, it's your first time here on the Beard World Order, why don't we just put you straight on the hot plate? <laughs> Give us your take. What do you think? World War Three? yay, nay, um, soon, later, never? What, what's your take on what's happening right now? Um, I, th I don't know. I think we'll probably find that we kind of all, I, I would think that all three of us would probably have a similar view in that uh, it seems almost inevitable with all of the sort of buildup that's going on around the world 
Um, you can look at the encircling of Russia. You can look at the uh, current crisis uh, in the Middle East right now, be it Syria or Iraq or, you know, name, pick a country. Uh, so it does seem at, at, at that we are, you know, arriving at some sort of uh, catastrophic World War III scenario. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's also, as you said, there's a lot of hype around this. And um, I, I'm a little bit torn between the two because it does seem that, uh, you know, w well, what is NATO doing? Uh, if this isn't preparing for some sort of all-out global uh, war, then indeed why are they, you know, constantly building up? Why is uh, everybody and their mother talking about how, you know, Russia is going to, uh, you know, march on the United States or, you know, whatever <laughs> mm -hmm. the crazy scenario is? Uh, but at the same time, I think that there is also, um, I think as we'll explore, other agendas that get pushed. Uh, during times of war, uh, and that might be more of, of what's really going on. But yeah, on, on some level, uh, I I hate to say it, but I think that um, some sort of uh, war will be inevitable uh, because there's just simply no way that America and NATO and the Western forces and what have you can continue on this path without uh, somebody sort of stepping up and saying, well, enough is enough, you're not going any farther than this. And we kind of see that uh, very much in Ukraine. Um, you know, I don't know what the, the end game solution is there, uh, but it does seem that uh, on some level this could be some kind of military confrontation between Russia and the Western powers. Indeed. Well, you know, I, I see what both of you are saying here. And, and before I forget, I want to mention just one quick article also that since, James, you were running through a, a few of these that are kind of putting this sort of, um, uh, this idea out there. And it, again, like you said, this is nothing new. It's been kicked around for a while now. But I did want to mention this quick article that I came across the other day that I found uh, uh, relevant to what we're talking about. It's a, out of Washington'sBlog.com. It says, uh, the headline is, Top Financial Experts Say World War III is Coming Unless We Stop It. And it's a collection of different statements from, as the headline says, financial experts from uh, mainly uh, the United States. Uh, talking about the potential for a world war or some kind of war, some kind of conflict as a result of, of the economy, as a result of the, of, the, of the world's finances. So that's something also that's worth paying attention to what these guys are saying. But um, I guess when I when I first, uh, you know, when I first heard the topic suggested by you, James, and we were sort of I was sort of thinking about this uh, a, little, a little bit yesterday. Um, sort of thinking, you know, as far as a World War III type scenario, well, I will agree that that certainly things are shaping out for some sort of, of confrontation. Uh, it, it seems to be headed in that direction. As you said, Pierce, I mean, why else would, would NATO be doing what they're doing uh, unless they're preparing for some sort of confrontation? However, when I think of a World War III type scenario, uh, of course, you know, I have to go back to uh, what we know uh, from history through World War I and World War II. And uh, I, I guess my question is, like, I'll throw this back because I don't, I don't know how, if ever, we'll see a, a war on that scale, in, in, on that dynamic. Because, you know, as we know, uh, as, this is not breaking news. I'm not, I'm not telling anyone anything they don't already know. But the U.S. has not officially declared war since World War II. Uh, we just don't go to war in this way anymore. And I don't see why the United States ever would again. Why would they defer to Congress and officially declare war and go through the Treasury and go through all that hoopla when we can just have these uh, low intensity conflicts and keep that going? Uh, seems to be working pretty pretty well for the American Empire anyway so far. So why rock the boat? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but I, I agree that there's something brewing. I just don't know if we'll ever see another world war in the sort of classic sense. And I want to get James's opinion on that. Well, then let me uh, let me kick back on what you yeah. said and agree with you. Um, <laughs> I, I I mean, the question of why would would it be different? Why would they do mm -hmm. something different than what they've been doing for the past 70 years? I think it's ultimately not going to be their choice. I mean, mm. it's, sure, I think if the U.S. had their had their their druthers, <laughs> I don't know how to say that in regular, <laughs> um, they would obviously just keep doing what they're doing because it's obviously worked out quite well for them throughout this whole Pax Americana um, period. Um, a complete misnomer, by the way, because of course it's not a time of peace. It's a time of constant low-level intensity conflicts that uh, they get to sort of sweep under the rug and not make... Of course, it's not called war because they right. don't declare war, etc., as you say. But I, I think ultimately that... Um, the idea of the Third World War is that eventually there will be a force that will push back against that and that will force the issue to a head. So 
I think that would be the response to that. But I agree with you very much so that I don't, I, I mean, the Second World War didn't look like the First World War. The First World War was a trench war that, uh, that was along certain lines that were carved out very early in the conflict. The Second World War was much more dynamic. The Third World War, uh, I just can't imagine how that would play out right. given the weaponry that's available now in some sort of years-long protracted battle between major superpowers. I just don't understand how such a war would really work in that, in that context, which is why I think the old adage, there's an old military adage that the, uh, the military planners are always planning for the last war. Mm -hmm. I think the public also is kind of caught in that mentality that we still think of war as we've grown up with it all our lives watching the documentaries about World War II or what have you, we look at that and that's, that's what war looks like. That's what war is. I think we've entered into a completely different era in which war does not look like that and it will not look like that if it does actually come to that point. I think what we are more likely to see is exactly as the Washington's blog article you're talking about there um, indicates with the financial experts, it is going to be more of an economic conflict. I think that there is going to be economic war um, waged. I, I think it's already starting to be waged, but I think that's going to take on a different form and a more it's going to come more to a head. And I, I don't claim to understand exactly how this is going to work, but I do think that it is going to be more in an economic arena than it is necessarily on a battlefield. Um, that will involve mm. all sorts of other peripheral ideas there, like cyber warfare and things things of that nature, trying to disrupt um, financial infrastructure and, and, uh, and things along those lines. Um, I just don't know, you know... Uh, I, again, if someone pushes the button and starts uh, the nukes flying, then uh, I think all bets are off the table, and I think that's what we all want to avoid. Mm. But uh, I could imagine some sort of economic conflict eventuating from this. And I think along those lines, probably the most significant step along the path that we've seen recently is the food import sanctions that were just placed last week by Russia. I think that was a huge escalation of what's going on because it, we have lived through this era where the American empire has been able to assert its will uh, unilaterally for so long and with so little kickback that they can impose their sanctions, they can basically dictate reality to the outside world. Uh, along comes Russia and Putin, and, and, and they actually try to flip the table. They try to actually um, kick back with sanctions that are they're not exactly going to end the economic world as we know it, but they are. there are significant sanctions. We're talking about billions of dollars in terms of the agricultural industries in Europe, in Canada, in the United States, in Australia. These are significant sanctions that will have an effect. So I think that we're starting to see what an economic tit-for-tat uh, skirmish looks like in the build-up to a potential uh, war. Um, but having said all of that, again, uh, at a certain point, I don't know how an economic war doesn't spill into some sort of military conflict or how that would be avoided. Um, so I guess I, all I can say is my thinking on this subject is still quite muddied. Pierce, clear the waters for us. <laughs> well, I think maybe uh, it's important, as you were saying, you know, a general is always prepare for the last war, I think it's important to maybe come at the idea of World War III from a different angle and to perhaps think more broadly that we're already in multiple world wars, be it the war on terror or the war on drugs, where we virtually, I mean, the war on drugs, I mean, affects literally every single person on the planet and is, uh, you know, as far reaching as you can imagine. The same with the war on terror. So these world wars are already going on. And uh, a lot of time I see the the World War Three example as this sort of distraction issue that shifts attention away from the fact that we're in a perpetual war. Um, you can, you know, uh, people will talk about World War III and, oh my god, Russia's gonna nuke us and we're gonna have to nuke Russia. Uh, and while that goes on, you know, uh, the Obama starts bombing Iraq again uh, with absolutely no <laughs> uh, protest or, or, I mean, really even anything. I mean, not even in the alternative media, it, there's such uh, apathy, I think, towards this perpetual war state that it kind of happens and it's, uh, you know, the articles you see are very like, uh, you know, oh, phew, what a surprise, you know. Here we yeah, go again. You know, right. Bombing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so I think a lot of time this, this you know, World War Three stuff is, it needs to be seen in a different context. Um, but again, I don't know. I think, you know, there's uh, some part of me in the back of my head that sort of sees that 
uh, as you were saying with the the stuff with Russia right now, I mean, uh, you know, you've got countries in uh, Europe uh, like Poland and, and some other places that are really uh, terrified. Uh, because you know, if you cut Apple imports uh, from Poland, uh, suddenly you have millions of people out of a job. Uh, so no, 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 how does Poland react? Uh, and that sort of uh, it sort of translates into a lot of these sort of entangling alliances and some of the echoes of World War One. But when you have all these countries that are so interdependent on one another, you do get to a point where this economic warfare will reach a a point where I don't really inter you know I don't think there's another option that will be on the table aside from some sort of military action. Uh, you know, if, if these economic sanctions with Russia uh, get to a certain point, I, I mean, what, what other choice do they really have? Um, and again, with these economic sanctions, we see the line sort of being drawn. Uh, we're now, you know, we get countries like Belarus and, uh, you know, some of the other uh, countries in Russia's sphere of influence, you know, upping their imports. Uh, and, you know, we can kind of see the battle lines being drawn there. So, I mean, what does that say? I, I'm not really sure exactly. But, again, I, I think while we shouldn't obsess over World War III, uh, I, I don't know. On some level, I don't really see where is this military buildup going. You know, and it's not just Russia. I mean, uh, look at China. Look at the, the Senkaku Islands. Uh, you know, James, that's very close to you, and I don't think that's going to start World War III. But again, uh, I mean, what happens if China takes one of these islands by force? Uh, we, you know, what, what, what does Japan or America really do? Do they, you know, go in there by force? Uh, I mean, what is that, you know, how does that escalate from there? Uh, so it is uh, troubling, and I think that's also part of this whole thing, is to keep everyone on edge, to keep everyone in a perpetual state of fear uh, that at any moment World War III could, could start, uh, when, of course, this helps to you know, sort of put the blinders up on people um, from seeing the, you know, war that's going on literally all over the planet. Uh, so, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think we're we're going to probably see a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I wanted to say just quickly that, that uh, when, as you initially started talking about this, Pierce, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say uh, that, that, that exactly, that we are already in a sort of World War III-like scenario, if you think of it in a different way. As you said, James, you know, something you said actually really struck me because I think we do have to think about the way we think about war, the way we, we define war uh, now in the modern era, because as you said, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to look like World War I and World War II. It, and, 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 and in that sense, World War III has already begun. As you said, we are, America, uh, at least, is at war in, in you know multiple continents. Um, it's, I guess, in a way, at war with Russia by proxy, right? In since Syria, the Ukraine, and some would argue in, in, in Latin America. Although I take a, a slightly different view there, I think. But but I've seen that argument made, uh, and so I guess what we're really asking is whether we're going to see an escalation. If we're going to see an, an overt military confrontation between the United States and Russia specifically. That's, I think, what we're really driving at is if is that going to happen? Are we going to have an all out nuclear war as a result of that? And I would certainly hope not, of course. But 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 yeah, I think I would agree with both of you so far that that I think that that war has already begun. Now we're just really asking about a matter of degree. Right. Yeah. A matter of degree, a matter of the, the way in which this uh, this will be waged, um, the way that it's distraction from from other issues, as Pierce says, I agree with what you're saying. But I guess the question then is is sort of a question of of the battle lines. I mean, if if we are being drawn into some sort of conflict, again, whether however it eventuates and whether or not we can call it World War Three or whatever. But clearly battle lines are being drawn right now. And I think that the obvious battle lines that people would say as a first approximation would be something like, you know, the BRICS versus NATO or, or something along those lines. We kind of see those kind of battle lines drawing. And of course, the BRICS Development Bank is a, as a um, battle against the Washington consensus and, and these types of challenges that are being posed right now. And it seems, you know, I mean, Russia and China are clearly being encircled by NATO. So they have a common kind of enemy there that makes them kind of drives them into each other's arms, etc. That's I, I think would be the conventional assessment of what we're looking at. But Pierce, what you just said, for for example, pointing out Poland, for example, and the, 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 the kind of tight position that they're in, given that 
you know, sanctions, certain sanctions implied in the right way by Russia could completely um, devastate some of their uh, their agricultural industry. Or, I mean, look at South Stream and the different uh, kinds of wrangling that's been going on there in Eastern Europe with some of the Eastern European nations being uh, bristling quite a bit at uh, at Brussels trying to tell them, you know, don't do, don't do business with Russia. Well, hey, it would do really good for our country. I think there are some interesting divisions going on that might complicate that BRICS-NATO kind of battle line narrative. And I want to explore some of that. And one of the interesting things that I came across just as I was sort of researching for today's conversation, China's nuclear parasol. So the diplomat uh, was reporting on a Washington Times report from December of last year in which uh, China um, was giving security guarantees to Ukraine back when Yanukovych was in power not only pledging not to use nuclear arms against Ukraine, <laughs> which I'm not sure why China would be doing that in the first place, but also to actually pledge security if Ukraine were to, uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity were to be violated by any sort of nuclear invasion, quote unquote, nuclear invasion, um, China would step in, which is, I mean, bizarre and mm -hmm. also brings with it all sorts of questions about about China and its role and whether it really is an ally of Russia or it's just kind of, you know, driven into their arms by convenience, but mm -hmm. they're not necessarily partners. And there's a lot of things to complicate that very straightforward narrative that sometimes is drawn. Um, Pierce, what's your take on what the battle lines of, of that we're seeing drawn really are? Yeah, I, I think that you're, you're, you're correct to pick up on this because it doesn't seem as, as clear cut as... Uh, the mainstream media would have us believe, and it's certainly nothing like World War II or World War One, where essentially, you know, you had uh, pretty identifiable groups that were fighting one another. I think it also the, the yeah, I don't really buy this China Russia, uh, you know, friendship. I think that they, uh, you know, historically speaking, they've they've always been sort of uneasy with one another, uh, and this is, you know, uh, forever. I mean, I mean, since you know. 60s, 70s. It doesn't really matter at what you know at any point. And China essentially has always been about uh, protecting China. And uh, you know the, the Chinese people, the, the Chinese government has a you know they've uh, always sort of you know wanted to separate themselves from others. They've you know they've never wanted to be colonized by anybody. So I don't think that this Russia-China thing is more than. Uh, a sort of you know tacit agreement that yeah let's sort of support one another in things like the UN uh, or perhaps somewhat in uh, economic issues you know let's have a little bit of a buddy but when push comes to shove uh, I don't think that there you know if there was some war was to break out between the United States and Russia let's say I don't think that China would come in and and back the Russians. Um, well, th see, let me let me el elaborate on that because I think the interesting part of the China Ukraine thing going on there is the fact that China is all very concerned, always concerned about territorial integrity and don't interfere with other people's you know uh, territory and things. Of course, Russia has a very different perspective on Ukraine and and what's happening there and sees Ukraine as its sort of traditional backyard territory. So it's it's kind of Russian space or in that orbit, and Russia has. At the very least, there is that old kind of Soviet mentality that there is this kind of satellite around Russia that's, that's kind of part of Russian politics, which is a very different idea than what China's going on. China is all about, you know, these are the borders and no one messes with the borders. So they have at points at which I think they would very much disagree. And I think we saw some of that in the Syrian conflict as well with uh, China, again, being um, very, very wary about some of the uh, the interventionary moves that were being made, even by Russia and, and trying to protect the Russian interests in, in Syria. Um, China is more all about the hands-off. So I think that's at least a potential point at which that comes to a head. Yeah, and, and I, I, I absolutely. Um, and, and we've seen that in other things, too. I mean, you know... Uh, China backs Sudan, but uh, I don't think that they would necessarily send troops in if the United States invaded. And the, you're talking about uh, uh, Sudan probably being the closest African country with China. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I can't really imagine that. Now they'll 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 you know talk up the rhetoric, of course. But uh, going back to the what are the battle lines? I'm not really sure exactly because um, y you know I, I was when I was sort of thinking about this, I was uh, trying to think a little bit with World War One, the anniversary of that, um, and sort of 
relating what would be because you know you, you're hearing all these academics talking about oh you know it, it's similar but not really it's not going to happen uh, you know we don't we don't need to worry but oh my god Russia <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know a, a a conflict that is in, in some ways is kind of similar uh, could be what's going on right now in um, uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia in the uh, um, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a little breakaway region. And this, in some ways, kind of relates um, with the, say, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, in that you have, uh, you know, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and Serbia, and, you know, you could ask virtually anyone, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, right, that's what started World War One. But there's, you know, absolutely no context to what the Serbian nationalist movement meant, uh, what Franz Ferdinand meant to anybody. You know, more people are familiar with the band than they are with the, <laughs> the person that he's, you know, they're named after. Uh, and, you know, with this breakaway region, uh, I see that as kind of, um, you know, something similar in that Armenia is backed by Russia. Uh, Azerbaijan is very much backed by the United States. Um, and some kind of issue between the two of them, that could escalate into a, a, a larger kind of scale problem. Uh, and it you know, would be in a region that virtually no one knows about, no one would understand. Uh, but suddenly, you know, we would hear these talks about, uh, you know, Russians butchering uh, the Azerbaijan and, you know, uh, the you know, United States butchering Armenians and, oh, my God, another genocide there, you know, God forbid. And you've got gas and oil pipelines. Um, but to even expand on that more, you know, uh, Russia sells a lot to Azerbaijan. Uh, so, again, I don't think there's any clear-cut sort of uh, battle lines drawn between the two. And on a further note, I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon. A lot of this is hype to get international attention. But that is a sort of situation, I think, again, thinking outside the box, that is the kind of situation that could spark a World War III. Not necessarily Ukraine. I, I really, I do think that, you know, Europe does not want to see another massive war that's going to, you know, uh, I mean, World War I especially, I mean, you're talking about wiping out millions and millions of people uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, brutal, brutal things. Uh, Europe doesn't want something like that again. But some sort of low intensity war or some sort of small proxy war in a Central Asian country where we don't really know anything and we can kind of do whatever, you know, that could be something. But again, even those battle lines are not very clear cut because I don't really know, uh, you know, would, would, would Russia really do, want to get involved? Um, so I, I'm not really sure what the, the battle lines would be. And I think, again, it would be more proxy based. I don't think we're going to see formal troops really fighting one another. Uh, and, you know, that is sort of the kind of go-to uh, protocol all over the world right now. So, you know, of course we're involved in Africa, we're involved in Central Asia, but not in any, you know, formal sense where we've got battalions or we've got conventional warfare going on. Um, but, you know, I know that's, that's, a, that's a whole big can of worms I just opened up there, so I'll, I'll throw it back to you guys. No, and it's, it's very, very interesting, especially as you guys are talking about the dynamic between uh, Russia and China and whether and what's really going on beneath the surface. Because, again, superficially, they have many of the same shared economic interests. And I wanted to throw in uh, another dynamic to this conversation. We focus, we focus mainly uh, so far on the eastern hemisphere. I wanted to throw in the western hemisphere a little bit because I had a conversation about this on the last two-hour radio, which is not yet uh, published, but it will be soon, uh, but with, with a friend of mine. And we we're talking about how uh, on the eastern hemisphere, this, this new Cold War, uh, as you said, James, is heating up. You, you know, we have, you know, these low-intensity conflicts uh, happening right now. Um, but on the western hemisphere, we have Russia and China, again, at least superficially, with mutually uh, shared economic interests in Latin America. We had uh, Putin and uh, Xi uh, Jinping recently uh, tour Latin America and uh, uh, go through uh, the various, uh, the, they visited the, uh, the BRICS summit, of course, and we had Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, Argentina entering into economic agreements uh, with Russia and China both. Uh, there's this new uh, Nicaraguan uh, canal being built uh, to compete with the Panama Canal, which I found really interesting. Uh, I saw some notes about this that uh, they're citing that uh, the canal will be wide enough to possibly uh, have uh, Russian naval ships uh, pass through. And they mentioned this because, coincidentally, uh, Nicaragua is scheduled to host a, a Russian uh, resupply base 
uh, uh, sometime in, in the near future, they swear that they will not be, <laughs> they will not have actual, you know, n- ships stationed at this. It'll just be a, a, a resupply uh, station. But uh, anyway, so I wanted to throw this dynamic out there because, again, so far this has remained very much a, a cold sort of, you know, posturing sort of thing on this Western Hemisphere in Latin America uh, mainly. And I wanted to get a sense from you guys what you think about this potentially becoming more of what we see on the eastern side of the world. Uh, is that a potential? Does that is that uh, uh, does that strike anyone as a potentiality, or will they remain simply you know beating their chests and posturing in the way that they are? Well, I I would say I mean there's a there there certainly is a sense at which this may be of a piece, and as you gesture there towards Nicaragua and Russia and some of the ties there, I mean there have been people talking. For example, I just saw that uh, with regards to these sanctions um, that uh, that Russia has just imposed on Europe and and America and Australia, the food import sanctions. Um, the now the European Union is is lobbying in Latin America to get the governments not to rush in and take their place and start selling to to Russia mm. to you know may take advantage of this. So I mean, there's definitely some interesting geopolitical things that are now really starting to span across the globe and and reach across the ocean there. That um, I mean, EU Latin American geopolitical relations as they relate to Russia is not something that we would have really been thinking <laughs> right. about just even a few short years ago. So it yeah. is it is becoming part of a piece. And that, I think, again, adds at least some credence to the idea that this is shaping into a world war in the sense that we've been trained to think about that, um, that, that truly, I mean, Latin America will be an po- important part of that. And of course, I mean, it's explicitly there in the BRICS relation, obviously, with Brazil playing a key um, part in that grouping. So, um, so I, I mean, I don't, I don't know specifically about the tensions within Latin America. That's obviously your your expertise more so than mine. But uh, but I think it certainly can be seen to be playing a piece in the the sort of broader battle lines. Well, just, and I, I think that uh, you know, as as Russia say gets more involved, or, or China especially, I think that's the real thing. When China gets involved, that's when we start to see. Um, various mysterious uh, vague uh, you know terrorist movements such as al-shabaab in Kenya uh, and this recent spike of violence in Kenya supposedly being perpetrated by al-shabaab with all sorts of nefarious characters like Samantha Luthwaite mm. allegedly being involved in literally everything that goes <laughs> on there uh, you know this all comes on the back of, uh, of you know China's billion dollar investment in the country so um, the the uh, that canal that 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 China is um, you know going to help build, uh, I would not be surprised if all of a sudden we see some sort of um, you know quote indigenous group or or, or some sort of uh, you know freedom fighters or or, or just straight up terrorists uh, sprouting out of nowhere um, you know with you know brand new jeeps and AK forty sevens and nice uniforms and they've got a great social media presence and and whatnot. You know that's the kind of uh, I think that's the kind of world war scenario that we're going to see, and I think we're starting to see the fruition of that in Iraq, where after all of these years, we've now finally reached the point where it is mission accomplished in that the you know the, the country will never ever pick itself up again. Uh, and and this this latest uh, ISIS ISIL you know the form you know artist formerly ISIS. known as IS whatever <laughs> yeah you want to call it uh, you know that that is sort of the playbook and we're starting to see the beginning of that uh, right now in Africa where you know virtually every uh, place that China is involved um, we're seeing these these groups start to sprout up and they're becoming more and more powerful they're having a larger and larger presence. Um, so I think that, and uh, you know, uh, uh, in um, uh, Xinjiang, in China, uh, the same thing. Uh, these very well, seemingly, you know, uh, w- well organized groups that are are able to, you know, b- stab and kill a hundred people in broad daylight, um, and then seemingly kind of I don't know, escape or or, or it doesn't even matter. Uh, and that's the kind of that's the kind of, of, of war that I think we're going to see. And I, I, you know, I don't want to make predictions, but that the canal in Nicaragua, I mean, you know, don't be surprised uh, if we get some strange group popping up and, you know, uh, blowing up uh, some building near a Chinese facility. 
That's right. a very, well, well at any rate, those are the kinds yeah. of things we're already seeing, right? Yeah. I mean, those are the kind of gladio operations that have been going on for a while and will mm -hmm. presumably continue to do so as long as it uh, continues to benefit the people who are looking to destabilize some of those strategic regions. Um, but I, I think that your point uh, earlier on was well taken that uh, that it probably, the flashpoint probably will not be the one that everyone's looking at, Ukraine. It'll probably be somewhere else, something somewhat peripheral, um, if and when this actually does, I mean, if there is a point at which this spills over into crisis, it will probably come in some area where people aren't necessarily focused on, or at least not so much so. And obviously, I'm in the Asia Pacific, so I see all of these different squabbles that are taking place right now between China and basically everyone else. And, and then some of the internal squabbles, I mean, Japan and Korea also squabble with each other and all of these things. So, and of course, North Korea, the big wild card. So there's all sorts of different places where this could happen out here. And of course, that brings in America with its uh, pledges, security pledges. And uh, we could see something kicking off here. Um, as you say, it could happen in Central Asia. It could happen in Africa. It could happen pretty much anywhere. So... Um, so really, truly global. Um, but let's kick this conversation up a notch. Um, here on the Beard World Order, in recent conversations, we've talked a lot about conspiracies and meta-conspiracies. <laughs> well, what about the meta-conspiracy to start a world war or to stage a world war or to, to use a world war as a springboard to a, a greater agenda? And I think we can... Uh, it's something I often point out. I mean, obviously, after the First World War, what was the real... Um, uh, offshoot of that. Well, of course, there was the the uh, Versailles and the, the Paris Peace Accords or the Paris Conference, and of course, uh, carving up the world into the world that we now know it as, and basically drawing all the lines on the map that we now know. So that was pretty significant. At the end of the Second World War, of course, we get the United Nations, we get the IMF, and what eventually became the World Bank, the the kind of financial um, world infrastructure that we we've known for the last seventy years. So, what would develop from the Third World War? And obviously, I think that the same forces that have used every um, major conflict to try to drive the the agenda of global government um, closer to home will undoubtedly use the Third World War for such an, a, a scenario if that takes place. Um, now, we could bring in things like, and I think we should at least mention it, um, Albert Pike's letter to Mazzini back in 1781, or sorry, 1871, uh, quote, the Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agentur of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Ar Arabic world, and uh, political Zionism, the state of Israel, mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on the issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable <laughs> social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the m most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens, obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries, will exterminate those destroyers of civilization, and the multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits from that moment the, uh, be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without Without knowing where, whether where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally <laughs> out in the public view. The manifestation will this manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement, which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. End quote. Nailed this it. This is a much <laughs> quoted letter again, supposedly written in 1871. There are all sorts of questions about this letter in all sorts of different ways, but my point would be, I'll believe it when I actually see it. <laughs> I don't believe this letter exists, um, and I don't believe anything that w what it's talking about. But at the very least, the idea that such a conflict could be created as a springboard towards a greater agenda is mm -hmm. one that I think needs to be taken seriously. And on that note, I'm currently reading Hidden History, uh, uh, The Secret Origins of the First World War, which puts forward the case uh, about the First World War being um, created by British interests, specifically around the Rhodes Roundtable uh, group and how they, they fomented the First World War consci consciously and purposefully. And I think that would tie into the uh, testimony of Norman Dodd, um, looking at the archives of the Carnegie Endowment and how they were 
consciously trying to steer the, U the United States into war from their foundation in 1908. Um, I think that there are interests in seeing war fomented and used as a political tool Indeed. for changing society. So let's get your thoughts on that. Um, first, you can, of course, if you want to convince me that Pike actually did write that, <laughs> letter, please go ahead. Or otherwise, what, what you think the ultimate effect of, of a war might be in the longer term, the bigger well, agenda. You know, I have to confess that I, I was not familiar with that letter until you just read it, James. But um, I wanted to just mention something quickly because uh, on that note, on the on the note of, of the conspiracy to create conflict, um, I was actually going to ask you guys something before you you uh, pose that question, James, which is I, I think it relates. So it's I'm not gonna uh, <laughs> uh, you know monopolize the conversation. I'm gonna you know it, it's connected. Just follow me here for a second. Um, uh, something that Pierce brought up actually reminded me of this, and that again with on the note on the notion of creating conflict or a conspiracy to create conflict. I, I was going to ask you guys. What you guys think of the role of, of social media in World War III? And, I, and I'm not kidding. I know that might sound a little ridiculous, but uh, in, in the sense of you know, again, and, and fomenting conflict uh, in in the digital age. Because another story that I had my my attention on recently uh, was the story uh, that a, the AP broke about uh, USAID and Cuba, basically up to their old tricks as usual, uh, recruiting, uh, uh, sending, basically sending activists from other parts of Latin America into Cuba to recruit other activists to foment, you know, dissent, uh, you know, you know, that sort of stuff. But they were they were propping up these fake HIV prevention workshops, basically and going around posing as tourists. But again, yeah, same old stuff. And also curiously wondering why this sort of stuff continues to be tried over and over and over again and, and, and fail. And yet we have USAID in places like Ukraine uh, success, successfully orchestrating a, a coup. So just a, a little interesting dynamic there. But anyway, um, so no, on that on that note again. So you know, yeah. So I, I agree with you, James, uh, completely. That that these sorts of things can be created for larger ends. And I'm curious about how that would happen. And I think that that would probably play, play a role. Uh, and also, I forget, sorry, the story that I was originally going to mention was the first AP story <laughs> in which uh, the USA created that Cuban Twitter program. That's how social media ties in. Realized how I did not make that connection and many people were probably confused, like, what the hell is this guy talking about? That's the story that I was originally going to bring up. The Cuban Twitter, Zunzaneo, and, and looking up uh, activists uh, via Twitter or this fake Twitter program. Uh, something like this may have happened. It's been speculated. I, I don't have the articles in front of me at the moment that may have happened during the Arab Spring, that are the use of sock puppets, this, these so-called Twitter revolutions, things like this. So anyway, I um, wanted to throw that out there uh, and see if we can sort of make that connection between how it would happen and what the result would be. So I'll throw it to, to Pierce. Oh yeah, I think social media is the that's the is becoming more and more the catalyst for all of these sort of things. So you, you know, you put a hashtag and you say, you know, bring back our girls in Nigeria or bring back our boys in Israel and, and suddenly then you can go and slaughter as many people as you want or, or push whatever kind of ridiculous legislation uh th through and um of course I think you know, and then you get all of these you know, people like the Google executive, whose name is escaping me right now, in Egypt, uh, and his sort of shady connections with you know Google and other things, and I think the I think the social media uh, aspect of this also kind of brings in the you know if we want to get kind of meta and larger, but the whole transhumanist, the whole technology uh, kind of agenda behind uh, so much of 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 war, uh, and you know you can look at the the sort of the idea. Uh, that that's been put forth by a couple people, but um, Thomas Sheridan has been talking about this for a while in anticipation of of World War One. But you know this idea that you know World War One essentially being orchestrated by a bunch of uh, heads of royal of European royalty who are all related to one another. You know they're all related to the Queen of England, and you've got the Czar, you've got uh, the Kaiser, you've got uh, the Queen of Romania all of these countries and then they sort of you know they technologically advance everything to this point that uh, you know it, it's almost you, you know people didn't really even uh, recognize what this kind of warfare was like uh, and then suddenly you depopulate all of Europe at a time when many of these countries were very stressed economically uh, that you know they can't provide for uh, all of these working-class dregs and whatnot 
um, and then you just kind of wipe out the whole population, and then you, you know, and again, you, you, and then technology kind of flourishes again. You get the telegraph, uh, you get all sorts of things kind of manifesting, and this melding between, uh, you know, technology and, and and people kind of going on. And I think that the, the we see that the I'm sorry, the telegraph. I think right. No, am I wrong? That was 19th century. Uh, well, there, there we go. I am confusing that with. Uh, I maybe have thought of the something else, but some kind of mass communication. <laughs> no, the, the, I suppose radio was coming into its own around the time. Yeah, there we go. That's what I meant. Totally. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to that kind of. You know, again, you, you get, and now we see that uh, somewhat here, where you know, uh, people live in their phones. They're tweeting about. Uh, World War III constantly, they're able to kind of foment change, and I think that's really uh, what World War III would kind of take on. Again, this depopulation, uh, that there's, you know, there's too many people, and what a wonderful way to, uh, to get rid of so many of them uh, through some sort of, you know, warfare. And again, we're seeing, uh, you, know, every, you know, you could just go to DARPA's website, and I mean, there really are uh, you know, molding uh, people and machines into soldiers, and this is kind of the the next level and the next stage of all of this. And then, uh, you know, again, the the whole GMO agenda, uh, you know, Monsanto, all of these groups that are kind of interconnected with one another, and you know, bio warfare as as a new sort of frontier. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of a long winded uh, explanation, but I think that uh, you know, if we want to get really meta, I think that's really the the kind of way we're getting pushed and uh you know and again that that enters you know so many occult ideas and and weird uh you know traditions <laughs> that uh kind of connect with transhumanism and, and connect with world war one as well so well I don't know, yeah no that's an excellent point let's stay on that for a little because certainly the technological aspect of this is important because obviously the first world war i mean it created the concept of shell shock and you had these people in the trenches just being um, blown apart by machine guns in ways that they'd never even imagined before blown apart by shells um, just sitting there in trenches waiting to be killed um, completely destroying all notions and myths of you know glorious war on the battlefield for patriotic uh, die for king and country kind of rhetoric, uh, all of that that was really being used and, and touted and poetry was being written in the early stages of the war, suddenly, I mean, by the end of the war, that, that type of rhetoric was just ridiculous. I mean, it truly changed um, our, our consciousness as human beings and, of course, opened up all sorts of horrors, not only the mechanistic side of warfare that, that was unleashed there, but also um, the the, uh, uh, the gases uh, that uh, the Germans released in the, in the trenches and things like this. I mean, it truly changed uh, the way that people looked at uh, at the, the the potential for human conflict and all of these technologies. World War II obviously ends with the shock and awe to end all shock and awes. I mean, the, 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 the atomic bombs, which again completely change our conception of physics, um, let alone, I mean, how uh, energy, um, I mean, it completely transforms us um, societally uh, conscious in terms of our consciousness, in terms of the way we relate to the world. It does bring to, to mind the question of what World War III will unleash on the world um, and what types of mechanistic horrors will be unleashed and what types of technologies will be revealed um, through the, that conflict. Because again, I mean, the average person uh, had no concept of splitting the atom before World War II started, but uh, everyone knew about it in the in the wake of that. Um, the average person today has very little understanding about some of the technologies that already exist for weather manipulation and um, whatever other kinds of crazy uh, projects that DARPA is working on that, uh, that's sitting there in the bowels of the Pentagon waiting to be used. Of course, warfare is always the excuse to unleash all of these technologies, bring them out into the open, and uh, get people to obey their, their robot overlords or whatever is coming. Um, <laughs> it's a very good point because clearly if there is a transhuman agenda, and I think there certainly is, um, World War III would be a wonderful place to unleash uh, some of these uh, technological nightmares that, that will be part of introducing this to the public consciousness. Indeed. No, I think you're both right. And in fact, as you said, if there were a depopulation agenda, what, what better way than, as you said, Piers, through a, a, a World War uh, type scenario? Uh, and something else that I wanted to mention just quickly, because on, on the, again, on the, the notion of 
a bit of staging a conflict, orchestrating a conflict for some other some other ends, some economic ends, perhaps, as we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. A lot of that is driven by by economics, and that Paul Krugman famously said a couple of years ago that that you know why not tell people aliens are invading? Why not? Why not create some sort of false alien invasion a type scenario, fake yeah. right? <laughs> it's a, in order to you know uh, pump out some more some more dollars and get that get the some more uh, uh, deficit financing going. So I mean, there's there's that angle also as far as w- what could potentially drive a sort of manufactured crisis. Um, I don't know, but uh, w- what what would result from it? You know, I shudder to think, as you said, James. I mean, what kind of horrors? Would be unleashed. What kind of horrors that, that we don't even know exist yet uh, that have been kept from us or from the general public uh, mostly? You know, it's 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 amazing to think. Horror, I think, is the key word because I think that really is. I mean, what better way can you shape or reshape a society's fundamental beliefs than through just witnessing the absolute atrocities and horrors of war and thinking anything we can do to avoid that and how how fundamentally can that transform a society so i mean regardless of the veracity of pike's letter i mean at, at the very least the the idea underneath it is that you know having witnessed this incredible destruction and bloodshed the world will be ready to say absolutely not we do not want this ever again you know please save we'll us do from- anything yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. which is exactly what led to the league of nations which is exactly right. what led to the united, united nations, nations which yeah. is exactly what's going to lead to whatever comes out of world war three and it's the yeah. same mentality and psychology and, and, you know? and people don't even have to think that far back you know our memories are short but just think back to just you know what 13 years ago after september 11th what what were americans mm-hmm. willing to do and to accept after that sort of shock imagine something on a, on a much 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 larger scale what what horrors will we come to accept then again it's i started to think but i mean it's only logical to conclude that 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 one would or, or people would uh willingly accept any all all manner of horrors uh, in order to, you know, stop the the next war or whatever it might be. We cannot leave this conversation here. No, we <laughs> <laughs> have to talk about. You know, yeah. so what what is this? What what can we posit here? What can we say to break this cycle? Break this conditioning? Mm-hmm. Derail the, the the freight train? Disrupt the narrative? What can we do? I th- I think it's important to take a step back and to um, you know think about this logically in the sense that I you know it, it I don't think that this is going to happen tomorrow I don't think this might even happen 20 years from now or it may never really happen in the way that we're describing this um, and again it's important to keep that in mind because the fear mongers uh, everywhere in the mainstream media and the alternative media uh, you know academics politicians they want you in this constant state of fear uh, and you know, if you allow yourself to be totally and one hundred percent consumed by this, uh, then you you either are totally willing to allow any of your freedoms and liberties to be you know destroyed, or you become so apathetic that you simply just don't care, uh, and it just merely becomes a oh yeah, see, duh, I told you, you know, you were all sheeple, you were all you know asleep, <laughs> uh, you know, look look what happened uh, later, you know. Uh, let me get on with my life. And that's really a dangerous sort of path to go down. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, we also uh, need to, uh, you know, come up with real tangible solutions to some of this. And, uh, you know, they could be uh, as small as, um, you know, not paying your federal income tax, uh, which mostly goes to warfare. Uh, and that doesn't seem like a big massive kind of a thing but that's something small that you can do and that's something that you know does make a difference i mean the irs wants that money <laughs> you know they they you know and that's a small thing but i think more broadly speaking um we need to kind of take a step back we also need to live our lives uh and we need to not be constantly um you know fooled by by so many different people that are willing to kind of lead us down into some sort of a trap uh, where suddenly, uh, you know, we are concerned about, you know, a nuclear weapon going off in New York City or, uh, you know, uh, an Ebola virus, uh, you know, wiping out half the planet. Um, you know, we need to kind of, uh, you know, get outside, uh, you know, talk <laughs> to people, uh, unplug from everything. 
you know, living your life is a very big part. And essentially, you know, the powers that be don't want you to live your life. They want you to live in this little tiny box and have this, you know, tiny index card of allowable thought and speech to dictate everything that you do. And any kind of resistance to that, I think, ultimately um, is, uh, you know, is a, a bullet in our chamber uh, against them. Um, and and that's a, a really positive thing as well. And again, I you know I I think that so much of this World War Three scenario is about programming us into a certain mindset. And uh, if we can kind of break that programming, and if we can kind of think for ourselves, and if we can uh, you know uh, allow ourselves not to be fooled by this, uh, that's you know to the detriment of these you know psycho elite globalists. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, one small thing that we know. Yeah, it's a good point. And, you know, I, I want to just add this, not, not to keep, you know, not to persist with the pessimistic tone, but I do want to, I just want to add this and I want to get your thoughts on this chance because this is something we've touched on before that I think that there's a delicate balance between, as you said, Pierce, living your life, because I think that's true. I think the best way to live free is to live free, is to, is to act, live it, is to act, act in that manner. However, I think it's a del delicate balance between, you know, Living your life and not caring about what's going on, you know, it's 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 a it's a tricky thing to sort of sort of, as I said, balance out uh, in one's own mind and in one's own life. So, uh, on that note, I want to. I'm just curious what you think about that, James. As I said, something we've talked about before with regard to the surveillance state. You know, how much should we, you know, care about what's happening? How much should we just, you know, live our lives and not be uh, not succumb to it and, and change our behavior as a result of that knowledge? You know. It's a similar sort of dynamic, so I'm curious what you think about about that, what Pierce said in, in that sort of sense. Well, yeah, okay, so let's see if we can synthesize what you two are saying there, because I certainly understand what Pierce is saying in terms of, you know, living our lives based on fear and around the fear and, and uh, how we can be railroaded into agendas that we don't want because we're basing ourselves around these potential future scenarios that go around in our heads. But at the same time, I mean, in 1914, millions of people found themselves, they were in a situation, there is war. And however it came about, it's happening. And uh, you have to face that as a reality. In uh, 1939, it happened. Pe millions of people suddenly found themselves in war. Um, and it could happen again. I think that the underlying part of this that I think connects these ideas is that the the one thing that we that we have that we always have we always will have as long as we are free independent human beings is our consciousness we have our consciousness that we control and the, i think the most important thing that we have to maintain is our own our own identity our own integrity our own sense that we're not going to subsume our identity in rallying around the flag or rallying around whatever, you know, the, the disaster, whatever disaster is the uh, flashpoint for, for some sort of war scenario. We have to maintain our integrity and maintain ourselves. And it's exceptionally difficult to do. I mean, back, of course, in uh, August 1914, they founded the, uh, the Order of the White Feather, persuading women to go around giving white feathers to men who refused to sign up for military service, um, labeling them cowards. You know, you're, you're a coward. And I mean, the societal pressure that comes when you are in that war scenario and suddenly it's like, if you're not going to fight the, these damn Ruskies, you're, <laughs> you're pretty much one of the enemy. Um, it's going to be exceptionally intense. And it's going to be something like, as you say, I mean, a 9-11 a million times over um and we all know how strong the pressure was to to just rally around the flag and and bow down to uh to to the powers that shouldn't be in that scenario it's going to be a, a million times more powerful in in the wake of whatever they're you know whatever might set off a world war one or world war three so again the point is we have to commit ourselves to maintaining ourselves in that state of detachment from those types of identities that they the, the things that they want us to subsume our identity in and again that's it's easy to say maybe or actually it wasn't so easy for me to say that quite <laughs> but it's difficult it's that much more difficult to actually do because again it's hard to even imagine the the pressure that's going to come on people to 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 get on board and uh if you don't support this war you know you're you're one of the enemy and we have to remember that we are free individual human beings and we do not have to rally around flags. We do not have to support wars. It doesn't mean we're against, you know, our, our neighbor who has been subsumed by that and who is uh, uh, consumed in their consciousness. But uh, it means that we're not going to support them tacitly or in any other way. And if there is a significant number of people who do that, 
wars cannot function. Wars cannot function at this point. Wars cannot function without human beings. And I realize that ultimately <laughs> the transhumanist agenda is to get us to that point where it doesn't matter. But, right. uh, but at least at this point, we still have ourselves. We still have our consciousness. No, I completely and if agree. I could just, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pierce. One, one quick thing, too. I think it also is, uh, it is getting slightly, not a lot, but it is getting slightly more difficult for, um, you know, these, the state to implement some sort of a war. And we can see that with Syria where, mm -hmm. I mean, it just people simply just did not want to do it. Uh, and even regular average Joes on the street were sort of hesitant in believing the sort of official line. And you can see that now in Ukraine. I mean, yeah, you, you know, we've got the, the, the plane crash, but it's not as if there is this, you know, of course you get people like John McCain or Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, the same person essentially complaining and, you know. <laughs> I've never yelling. seen them in the yeah. same room together. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no, that way, you know, who knows what they do behind closed doors. <laughs> but, um, you know, it is getting a little bit harder. Now, again, I think with if you had a 9-11 type scenario, uh, yeah, you're going to get, uh, you know, you could sway a lot of people. But I do have a little bit of confidence in that people, by and large, and you can even look at um, the conflict right now in Gaza because, um, you know, having been very much involved in what's going on there and and having been to uh the West Bank before I will really say that even here in New York where it is a extremely pro Israeli um kind of a environment uh a lot of people are starting to wake up to the idea that what is going on is is mass slaughter and what they're trying to do is is to exterminate a whole entire region uh of people and that is slowly kind of uh, you know coming around um you know, to the point where you even get people like Joe Scarborough uh, saying on MSNBC, this is not right, this is wrong. So I think there are little incremental things and we have to just kind of keep expanding on that and, you know, not to let uh, the, these big massive things get in our way. And, uh, you know, it might be slow and it might be painful, but little by little we are making significant changes. And, and that's just to kind of you know, keep things positive because there's so much gloom and doom and, and negativity um, <laughs> that, you know, you can get, you could just kind of wallow in it and yeah. kind of almost enjoy it on like a sick sort of a level. So I'll leave it there. No, you know, and I think you, you answered the question that I was uh, go about to, to ask because, uh, James, that when you were talking about how, you know, we each need to do this for ourselves to, to keep our identities and to not be uh, caught up in the group think and, and the rallying around the flag and that sort of nationalistic fervor that comes with war. Um, you know, I was going to ask, you know, well, you know, that would be easy enough for the three of us to do and the people who watch the show and who are in tune with this sort of way of thinking. But what about, you know, what about that neighbor? What about the, the majority of the people? But however, uh, you know, that's a good point, Pierce, that, that, that in, in, with that comp, uh, confrontation or that, you know, Obama's, you know, red line or whatever that was drawn with Syria and, you know, kicking it over to Congress and Congress saying now and the people saying now, you know, that's evidence of, of the tide perhaps changing with, uh, with regard to to our ideas and perceptions of, of war as a collective, at least here in the States. That's 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 something to be hoped for for, I suppose, that that's beginning to shift a little bit. I also see this happening with regard to the drug war. You brought that up earlier, Pierce, that, uh, you know, that how that affects uh, every person on this planet practically. And that's beginning to shift uh, as well, uh, the, at least culturally, uh, morally, uh, the sort of cultural norms are beginning to shift a little bit there. We have states in, the, in this country legalizing marijuana, which I honestly thought would not happen in my lifetime. So that was surprising to me. And that's something also that I find uh, some optimism in that maybe people out there uh, are waking up in larger numbers than I once thought. Maybe they're not all, you know, zoned out and, and, and fooled by the, by the same old propaganda. I think in a large sense that, that, that war on terror propaganda that was working so well for so many years, that's obviously faded a bit. That doesn't have the same effect anymore. So, yeah, there's, I think there's lots to be optimistic about and hopeful for for the future that perhaps most, uh, not most, but enough people are waking up to this sort of stuff and will not be fooled by the same old propaganda. Well, that's why we're here having conversations like this. It's a uh, small um, brick in the, the mortar of the wall that's going to create <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the society of the future. But hey, it's, it's something and uh, it has to start somewhere. And we do have this time where there, we're not in that all-out war scenario. So at, at any rate, we can continue to build this. And of course, who's essential in doing that? Of course, it is the viewers. So I am once again going to invite all sorts of feedback um, in whatever form 
you want to give that kind of feedback. And of course, people are encouraged to, uh, if Corporate Report members are encouraged to leave comments on the Corporate Report website, or you can email any or all of us, and that will, of course, be in, uh, uh, in the show notes. We'll have Indeed. the contact details for everyone. And do we have any beard-related news this week, James? Or are we going to leave it there? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I totally didn't look up beard-related news. Me, me uh, Pierce, have you got uh, anything? Any beard stories? Uh, Can I leave on a, on a sort of no, more light no. note? You can't leave it like that. Okay, <laughs> I'm on Google News of all places. Beard. All right. Uh, Keanu Reeves shaved his entire beard off. Oh, no. Point from ParisHilton.com. <laughs> um, Heller challenges Reed to beard off for Nevada's 150th what 150th beard competition anniversary i guess I 150th birthday all right so senator dean heller is growing a beard that in itself is not newsworthy well i would say it is but when it is attached to a challenge to senate majority leader harry reed to do the same well that's another issue oh there is there are beard can find stories every yeah. single time i can't think of another senator that that has a beard it is not common for politicians no, yeah. to have beards because, of course, it means you're hiding something. <laughs> <laughs> what are you hiding, Pierce? Right. All right, and on that weird note, let's end it. <laughs> okay, then. Let's close this out. So as James said, I want to echo what he said. Uh, we encourage you guys to send in your questions or comments to each of us, and, uh, of course, our contact information will be up in the show notes. Again, uh, James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. I'm going to get this right this time. Pierce Redmond, Porkins Policy Review. Dot wordpress.com Porkins Policy Radio is the program. Uh, come back and check us out next time. We'll be back next month and uh, I'm really glad that we were able to keep the monthly schedule, at least so far. So we're trying to keep that going. Uh, come back and join us on the Beard World Order. Thank you all for listening. I want to say this to the television audience. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. You are free to do as we tell you. Because people have got to know whether or not their presidents are crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. The Beard World Order.